There is nothing more painful than watching yourself on video. Nothing <laughs> more painful. I grew up in northeastern Kentucky near Ashland, Kentucky, and at one time, the headquarters for Ashland Oil was located there. Ashland Oil eventually merged and became Marathon Oil today, and located in Ashland are two small refineries for making the gasoline from the petroleum. As you drive uh, by them on Interstate 64, you can smell uh, the oil. You know, when we think of oil, uh, we typically think of petroleum the oil we need for running vehicles. If you don't ever check the oil in your engine, you could have a catastrophic failure of the vehicle. Uh, oil for a vehicle is like blood for our bodies. It's the source of life for uh, that vehicle. Well, when the Old and the New Testament eras were occurring, the kind of oil that would receive focus was olive oil. Now, when I was growing up, there was a different kind of olive oil. Uh, maybe you remember olive oil, the girlfriend to Popeye the sailor man. Some of you will remember that. But the olive oil we read about in Scripture is from the olive tree, uh, which were and still are very plentiful in the Middle East, especially in Israel. And so this morning, we're continuing the series, Mountains, Trees, Valleys, and Seas. We've already noticed two mountains, and we've noticed one of the trees, and we're going to notice the olive tree today. Last week, we noticed the first tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and today, the olive tree. And it's appropriate that today, we study the olive tree as a source of life, because at our third service, we're having our parent and family dedication, and we witness new budding life in infants. So I want us to see some occurrences of olive oil in Scripture, some uses of olive oil in Scripture, and then its meaning for our walk in the Lord today. There are several times that olive trees occur in Scripture. The first place the olive tree appears is when Noah and his family are in the ark, and they're waiting for the worldwide catastrophic flood to recede. In Genesis chapter 8 at verse 10, it says, he waited seven more days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. Noah had sent out the dove earlier, and it returned because there was nowhere for it to land. The second time he sent out the dove, it came back with an olive leaf. And that was the first symbol of life returning to a world that had just been destroyed. It was the first sign of hope that life again would be sustainable. Now, a lot of Bible scholars suggest that from the time Noah entered the ark to the time he exited the ark was at least one full year. Now, Noah, remember, was already 600 years old. I'm guessing his patience was probably growing a little bit thin. Uh, I am one-tenth exactly of Noah's age at the time, and I can't imagine being forced to wait for one year uh, before you could walk on land again. So the first use of the olive tree in Scripture is one that's both natural and geographical. Uh, sometimes the promised land is referred to as the land with olive trees and honey. The promised land would mean for the wandering Israelites a place of life and hope. So that's the first occurrence of the olive tree. The second occurrence of the olive tree is both symbolic and poetic. The olive tree picks up the idea of being kingly. The people of Israel were not satisfied with God being their only ruler, and they actually begged for a human king. In Judges chapter 9, verses 8 and 9, it says, One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Should I give up my oil, by which both gods and humans are honored, told sway over trees? It's a very strange and veiled reference here. But the other trees are the people of Israel, and they want an olive tree to be their king. Now, King David is later going to use the same reference to symbolically represent himself in the house of the Lord. Uh, Psalm 52, 8 says, but I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. When the Israelites thought of the olive tree, they thought of its deep roots. They thought of its stability, even during a time of storm. And they wanted that quality in a human leader. 
Uh, I think that's something our own nation is desiring right now. We've watched the fiasco of the last several years. We've watched the last few elections. I think there's a cry welling up in the land saying, give us a stable leader. And the third occurrence of the olive tree is a corporate one. It refers to the corporate nation of Israel. And later it refers to the covenant people of God. Uh, Jeremiah eleven sixteen says, The Lord called you a thriving olive tree with fruit that's beautiful in form. But with the roar of a mighty storm, he will set it on fire and its branches will be broken. Now, Jeremiah is writing to the Jews who are in exile in Babylon. He writes to them in the past tense, The Lord called. See, earlier Israel had been faithful to God, but now they'd broken off that relationship like an unfaithful marriage partner or like a rebellious child towards his parents. And since Israel was disconnecting from God, Jeremiah indicates there's going to be an inevitable judgment that's going to fall upon the nation. And the idea of the olive tree being a whole group of the people of God is later mentioned in the New Testament when the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome that there were two kinds of olive of trees. In Romans eleven seventeen, 17, he says, if some of the branches have been broken off and you though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. See, the nation of Israel was a cultivated olive tree. It was the one initially chosen to be the people of God, but then due to their own disobedience, God would now add a wild olive tree, which is going to be the Gentiles. And in the early church, there would have been both those who had Jewish background, those who had Gentile background, and the olive tree would come to mean those who are claiming to follow God and who are being faithful to Him. And so God was willing to provide the source of spiritual life to not only the Jews of the Old Testament, but to those who were not Jewish later in the New Testament. And Paul plays on that idea in Romans 11, the idea of grafting. The Gentiles, that's us, have been grafted into the very same promise that the Jews ha had. We can head towards our promised land, which is going to be heaven. We've been added to that olive tree. Uh, grafting is when a branch is uh, cut from one kind of tree, placed into another kind of tree, typically done with a fruit tree. Uh, closely related plants are compatible. You can easily graft one variety of apple onto another type of apple tree. Uh, there's known by several over in Israel a fruit salad tree. It combines things like plums and apricots and peaches all on the same plant. A, a branch that might not survive on a tree that's dying can be taken, placed on a tree that is strong and continues its lifespan. And that means for us spiritually that God took all of us and made it possible for us to be added to his plan of salvation. His promise of hope would expand to cover any human who wanted to follow him. Now, there's another occurrence of the olive tree uh, that represents it in Scripture, and that is that of Jesus' suffering. The night before the crucifixion, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And at the foot of the Mount of Olives, there is a small olive grove that would become an important site for Christianity. I've been there, and I know a few of you here uh, have been there. And the word Gethsemane is taken from the Aramaic word for olive press. And it's mentioned several times in the New Testament. It was a favorite place for Jesus and his disciples to go rest and pray. And it's in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus would accept his coming betrayal from Judas, and it's where he's going to be arrested. And that garden is still there today, and on the site there's a place called the Church of All Nations. And that enshrines the ground where Jesus is said to have last prayed. And most historians of that era, area say that the olive trees that are there today are the very same olive trees that would have been there when Jesus would have prayed the night prior to his crucifixion. Olive trees take seven years after being planted to bear their first fruit, and then they take another seven years to be fully grown and bear a complete harvest. And so an olive tree needs a long period of peace for its olives to grow and prosper. Uh, the olive branch became a symbol of peace. Uh, uh, we say about someone with whom we have a difference, you extend an olive branch to him. In other words, you make peace about the differences 
you have. And while the, olive tr- the olives from the fruit, uh, from the trees are its fruit, the more valuable product from the tree uh, is the oil that is squeezed from the olives. They're firmer than grapes. And so an olive press was needed to squeeze the oil from them. And that press had to use levers and torque and weight to squeeze out every last drop of that precious oil. And the symbolism of Jesus' suffering would be that his blood would be pressed from his body. The life-giving blood, his physical body, would be drained from him upon the cross. Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Just like an olive inside of a heavy press, crushing the olive for its pure oil, Jesus was crushed under the weight of the cross as he initially carried it. His body had been beaten with a whip, having glass and bones in it, allowing his skin to be shredded. It is a gruesome portrait of the dying Savior, but it's one we need to recognize if we're going to truly know the price that was paid for our sins. Now, I want to give you some uses of olive oil from Scripture. I'm just going to run down these very quickly. Notice, olive oil provided light. Exodus 27, 20. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that lamps may be kept burning. So, olive oil was used, for example, in the lampstand of the tabernacle as a constant reminder of God's presence among His people. There was to be a steady supply of oil to keep the light burning. Olive oil can be a symbol of the Holy Spirit of faith in the Bible. And the Bible says we are to be the light of Christ. We're to help ready others to see Jesus Christ in our actions. Uh, In Matthew uh, 25, Jesus told a parable about uh, ten virgins waiting for a bridegroom. Five of them brought their lamps, and they contained enough oil. Five did not have enough oil, and the five that were prepared were rewarded, and the other five were disowned. Parents on this day of dedication, they're having the role of continually keeping the light of Christ lit for their children. Parents, are you intentionally showing them how to live for Christ, or do you assume it's just going to happen? You think your children ought to be given the choice just to float and discover Jesus, or do you have a responsibility to help direct their steps? So olive oil was used for light, and we also provided nourishment. How many of you use olive oil in cooking? Let me see. All right, several of you. It was and it still is used for cooking. It's a much healthier alternative than other types of oils. Uh, there is extra virgin olive oil. That means it comes from pure, cold pressed olives and it's unrefined. Virgin olive oil comes from cold pressed olives and it has some refining. But plain olive oil has been treated with chemicals and it's often heated up to remove the impurities and to improve the shelf life. And that's honestly what most of us use is the processed olive oil. And that's due to typically the high cost of the other kinds. But the Mediterranean diet is thought to be healthier than many others due to its content of olive oil and its beneficial grains and fibers. But olive oil can do things like help brain memory. At least I think that's what it said. Um, It could help aid in digestion. It can help protect your bones from osteoporosis. It can help reduce your cholesterol. It can help reduce your blood pressure. I need to go drink some of this stuff. Uh, It's known to be beneficial in providing protection against uh, various kinds of cancers. Now, obviously, you ought to check with your medical professionals on a sudden high increased use of olive oil in your diet. But in that day, there really weren't other kinds of oils to use. And so it was a very natural oil, and it's a very natural oil for the body to use and to absorb. Olive oil is also used for medicine. Uh, Jer- or excuse me, Isaiah 1 6 says, From the sole of your feet to the top of your head, there's no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged, or soothed with olive oil. Uh, Maybe you remember the parable of the good Samaritan in Luke 10. He took the injured man and he bandaged his wounds and he poured oil on them for comfort. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, we didn't use olive oil on wounds. Uh, And what we did use was not used for comfort. Anybody remember Merthiolate? Do you remember methylate? Yeah, the number one goal for that medication was to make you scream so loud when you poured it on a wound that you forgot about the wound itself. Uh, 
one time, years ago, I was about 12 or 13. I still have a scar on my left hand right here. There's a real fine scar. I cut myself. My mom and dad were at work. It was a snow day from schools, like in February. And again, I was 12 or 13. I reached into the drawer, and there was a knife turned the wrong way. And when I pulled out a fork or a spoon, I sliced up against that knife, and it sliced this wide open. We had a nurse that lived a couple of doors down, and I wrapped it in cloth. And she happened to work midnight shift, so I knew she'd probably be at home. She might be asleep. But I thought, I better go down there because this is wide, gaping open. I'm, I could see the blood vessels and the bone in my hand. That's how split open it was. And I wrap this in cloth, and I go down two doors, knock on her door. Rosetta Elliott was her name. And she said, oh, my goodness, let's look at that. She unwrapped that, and she pulled that. She goes, my goodness, look at there. They look how gaping it open it is. I'll be right back. She came back with a bottle of merthiolate and poured it in the open wound. The whole bottle. I could feel it going down inside my arm. And it, was, it was amazing. Uh, no wonder that stuff was banned back in the early 1990s. I saw a meme the other day that read, you could have literally severed an arm in the 70s, and your mom would have slapped some of this stuff on your bloody nub and sent you back outside to play. <laughs> and what would your parents say when that burning started? Just blow on it. Just blow on it. It'll stop stinging. I wanted to look at my mom and say, you just blow on it, mother dear. <laughs> Merthiolate can teach you to do two things. It can teach you to dance, and it can teach you to speak in tongues <laughs> simultaneously. That merthiolate stuff was straight from Satan's fiery pit. Somebody sent me the meme this week. I was uh, telling a couple of preacher friends using this illustration, and one of them sent me this meme. It said, some of you have never had merthiolate, and it shows. <laughs> How many of you remember Bactine? Do you remember Bactine? Yeah, Bactine, I think, is still around, isn't it? And you could take it, and it sprays off. It would at least cool that stinging, that burning effect. Now, some doctors today will recommend Vaseline as a soothing comfort agent on surgical incisions to keep the area moist so it won't dry and crack. But olive oil in the first century was used as a skin moisturizer in Jesus' day. And there are already some other potential health benefits from it. James in the New Testament said when one is seriously ill, the person should call for the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them. And it, olive oil was what they would have anointed them with. And it was a sign of encouragement. It was a sign of offering a prayer that the person would hopefully become well. It wasn't considered to have healing power in the oil itself. It was a confirmation, you believe, that God could work even in the adversity. And olive oil was used for anointing. Anointing was the act of uh, setting someone or something apart for a specific task and a purpose. As the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and they had the portable place of worship called the tabernacle, God gave them some special instructions about anointing. Listen to Exodus 30, verse 22, beginning. The Lord said to Moses, take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much as that, that's 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of fragrant calamus, 500 shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel and a hen of olive oil. Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will become the sacred anointing oil oil. And so that oil was used to anoint like the tent of tabernacle, the ark of the covenant, all the accessories that were used in worship, the lampstand, the altar, the basin. And people were anointed for specific tasks. Uh, one of the best examples was when the prophet Samuel anointed David as the next king of Israel. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, 13 says, So Samuel took the horn of oil, and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. But what is the meaning for us today? Uh, there's a lot of study about the olive oil and olive roots and trees in Scripture. A uh, lot more detail we could go into about the anointing and, and the healing and the health benefits. But what is the meaning of the olive tree for us? What are some lessons we can learn from it to help our walk with the Lord? One is the roots of the olive tree are deep, representing our need to grow deeper in Christ. The roots of the olive tree are deep, representing our need to grow deeper 
in Christ. Olive trees have a unique root system that helps them survive in very dry conditions and to withstand extreme temperatures. Uh, the trees have a tap root that anchor the tree in the ground and it searches for a water source. And that tap root is usually at least three feet down, but it can grow as much as 21 feet vertically downward. And the olive tree has fibrous roots that are more shallow, but they spread out in every direction and they create a dense mat near the soil surface so that the water and nutrients at the soil surface can be absorbed. Nicky Otto in the book, The Olive Tree and the Word of God writes, as Christians, we believe that Jesus is the foundation of our spirituality. The name Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Yeshua, which originates from the Semitic word root, and it means to rescue or deliver. For olive farmers, the secret to success lies in having a strong root stock. Christian uh, author Becky Harling, who's written several books, she has a podcast called The Connected Mom. She has conversations about connecting more deeply with God and more empathetically with other moms and more intentionally with your child. She said, olive trees are strong and steadfast because their roots grow deep down into the soil. That's what allows them to flourish and thrive for years. I want my roots to grow so deep into Christ that I may remain faithful no matter my circumstances. I want to flourish in God's goodness as I offer my life to be used by him. And so olive trees, because of their vast root system, can withstand drought and frost and sub-zero temperatures and fire. Their roots are even strong enough to regrow after being cut down. And so the olive tree became a symbol, especially for the Israelites, it became a symbol of courage and strength and endurance and one's ability to overcome adversity. Paul writes about it in Colossians 2, 6, and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, you continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and you be overflowing with thankfulness. So what are you doing to deepen your roots in Jesus Christ? What are you doing to deepen your roots in Jesus Christ and His Word? If your faith is somewhat surface, if a storm comes along... Can you hold steady? Here's another lesson. The harvest of the oil tree impacts lives, representing our need to connect with others. The harvest of the olive tree impacts lives, representing our need to connect with others. From the olive tree, you have the fruit of it, the olives. But then you also have the oil from the olives. Uh, both the food and the oil impacts the lives of people. You know, sometimes you connect with other Christians, other times, you connect with non-Christians where you have opportunity to influence their lives. Now, olive trees are traditionally harvested by using a stick and beating the tree so that the olives will fall off. Now, today, uh, there's a little bit more modern method with power equipment, but then the olives are collected and they're used for either eating or for pressing the oil uh, out of them. I mentioned earlier that uh, olive oil is used in lamps for lighting. Uh, the oil obviously would soak the wick and thereby give light. Jesus is called the light of the world in the New Testament. We are told to be the light of the world. The word olive in the Greek language literally means to shine. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So with our lives, we're to be giving to people the true source of life in Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you like olives? Let me just see. How many of you like olives? Okay, most of All right, let's take the ultimate test here. Green olives, let me see your hands. Your green olives are your preference. I like them both, but green olives, okay. Black olives, let me see. We're praying for you. It's okay. <laughs> but you know both of them? I really did not know this. I, I, I thought they came from different kinds of olive trees. I thought green olive trees came from one kind of olive tree, and black olives came from another kind of tree, but that's not the case at all. So doing this study, I actually learned something about olives, and I do like eating them, but both of them can actually come from the same olive tree. The green ones are just picked before they're completely ripened. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more tart uh, than the black ones. The black ones are olives that have
have been ripened and then they're picked afterwards. But both kinds of olives can be found on the same kind of olive tree. And just like the two kinds of olives that exist, there really are basically two kinds of Christians. There are those who are newer in their faith, and then there are those that have withstood faithfully even through some difficult times. And for those who are more mature Christians that have been through difficult times and you've seen the Lord work in your lives and how he got you through those difficult times, you have been, if you will, through a ripening process. And no matter in which category you may fall, the attitude that a follower of Christ should have is what was expressed by David in that verse we already noticed. And that's how I want to close today is by reading this one verse aloud together. It comes out of Psalm 52.8 that I read a few moments ago. Let's read it out loud together. But I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. Notice what David says. He says, I'm going to be like an olive tree because I flourish in the house of God, and I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. That means even those difficult times I go through, those times that test me and bring adversity, I am going to be like that olive tree with roots that are growing deep, and I'm going to trust that God knows exactly what he's doing, even when I may not understand it. And today, maybe you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and begin a walk with him and begin to grow roots that are deep in him. And if you need to make that decision to follow Christ, to be baptized into him, or you need to bring your membership to our church, you can meet with me right up here near the baptistry area after our time of worship and communion. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ and that when adversity comes, that we can be like an olive tree whose roots are deep because of what Jesus Christ is willing to do for us and what he has done for us in forgiving our sins upon the cross of Calvary. And as we think about the suffering that he went through there in the Garden of Gethsemane, how literally blood was going to be pressed from his body, that he was going to suffer on our behalf because of all of our sins. May it make us more thankful each day of what he was willing to do. And so, Lord, as we come to you this morning, we pray that as we lift up the name of Christ and as we remember Jesus' death upon the cross of Calvary, that we realize all of our iniquities, all of our sins can be washed away because of his blood. Thank you that from him flows life, and flows life eternal. In his name we pray, amen.